Welcome to Astrophotography Japan. Hopefully you've been here before. In this episode, I want to show you how I adapted my planetary imaging technique and share some photos I took last summer of Jupiter, Saturn, and the Moon. These images were taken with the MK105 Maxitov Cassegrain Telescope from Sviboni. Actually, I took these photos from the curbside in front of my house in Yokohama, Japan, with this setup shown here. Sidereal tracking was driven by the AM5 mount in equatorial mode, using the ASI computer and ZWO cameras to acquire the image data. The MK105 telescope from Sviboni is something I bought specifically to view and image the planets due to its high focal length at 1,350 millimeters and its wide aperture at 105 millimeters. It is the most powerful telescope in my collection. The MK105 is a catadioptic telescope, which basically means it has a hybrid design utilizing both mirrors and glass lenses to achieve telescopic magnification and visual artifact correction, respectively. This is not my first YouTube video showing the MK105 or planetary imaging. However, it is the first video describing the use of the MK105 specifically for planetary imaging. Compared to episode 6, way back in 2022, I have refined my planetary imaging approach with convenient new accessories that I will describe here. The other video, episode 13, was specifically about visual astronomy using the MK105 to view comets, stars, and globular clusters. In my first planetary imaging video, I had two significant issues. One was a lot of drift due to poor tracking and the issues it caused. I employed guiding in that episode to try to correct for it. Frankly, I still do not know why I had that issue. It must have been due to some poor polar alignment. But I now know that guiding in EQ mode is not necessary for planetary imaging, as long as you have a decent equatorial mount and good polar alignment. In fact, good results can also be achieved in alt-azimuth tracking mode as well. If the planet remains in the field of view for at least a minute or two, and you can capture some high-resolution video footage, the image processing software is capable of handling small amounts of image drift or rotation that takes place from each frame to frame. The other issue I had was simply finding the target. At such a high focal length, it can be very difficult to find your planetary target and center it in the field of view. Generally, ASI Air will not work well due to the extreme brightness of the planet and low visibility of nearby stars in a small field of view, so you cannot count on the ASI Air go-to function to work properly to center on your planet for planetary imaging. It'll get you close, but then it becomes necessary to resort to other means. Compared to nebula or galaxy imaging, planetary imaging is easier in some ways, but harder in others. First of all, because planets are extremely bright in the night sky, imaging is done via video capture. In fact, all you need is a few minutes on any planetary target to capture enough data. Even if you are dodging low or mid-level clouds, it is possible unlike imaging of deep sky objects which requires hours of clear dark skies. In this video, I was using a flip mirror diagonal for the first time. Frankly, I originally thought this was an amateurish gimmick device, so I did not pay any attention to it until I realized the difficulty in finding a planetary target at high focal lengths, like when using the MK105. But I'm glad that I decided to give it a try. It worked as advertised and simplified the process. For less than $100, I bought one of these from AliExpress. It has a 2-inch and optional 1.25-inch nose piece that allowed me to directly insert it into the MK105 telescope. I could attach my ZWO camera to the back end by screwing it directly onto the M42 male threads that are conveniently positioned to allow the projected and focused image circle to reach the camera sensor in a direct straight line path. This happens when the mirror is flipped up as shown here on the left with the yellow arrow. However, as shown on the right, 
If you flip the mirror down and position it as with the green arrow, the image is diverted along a 90 degree diagonal to an eyepiece that sits atop of the device. There is also a kind of an adjustment ring setup that theoretically makes it possible to adjust the height of your eyepiece to reach a stable focus distance while at the same time your camera sensor is also in focus when the mirror is flipped up or removed from the light path. This dual focus matching feature is ideal but it really depends on the eyepiece design. You also have the option to lengthen the path to the camera sensor by adding M42 adjustment rings if you like. Keep in mind the Maxitoff design already has a corrected image. It does not require a reducer or field flattener, so you can achieve focus at any reasonable back focus distance within the reach of the Mac focus adjustment mechanism. Trust me when I say, this cheesy little flip mirror accessory is amazingly helpful, especially if you use an eyepiece with a crosshair reticule design to precisely identify the midpoint in the field of view. This Zviboni eyepiece is one of the first ones that I ever bought. I think that every amateur astronomer should have at least one good reticule eyepiece in their equipment portfolio, and this one I highly recommend. Its 70 degree wide field of view and premium image quality provides great views with an adjustable illuminated red crosshair design that is perfectly centered and razor straight. It is a great eyepiece. Since the field of view of the eyepiece is typically wider than the field of view of a planetary camera sensor, by manually centering the planet on the crosshairs, it will automatically be centered on your camera sensor as well. Adjusting the mount to center the target, in my case, was easy by using the AM5 hand controller while simultaneously viewing through the eyepiece to position the planet just perfectly right. However, the trick is still to first get the planet into the eyepiece field of view. With the MK105 telescope, a 20x eyepiece will still have a magnification of 68x, which is very high. So, Another finder method is also required, and for this, I use a green laser. Since the flip mirror works directly through the OTA, the eyepiece and visual ID of the planet is automatically aligned with the camera sensor, but the laser is not. It needs to be manually aligned to the OTA at some point prior to the imaging. High precision is required due to the high focal length. Alignment can be cumbersome, and achieving the necessary high precision is difficult when using a typical astronomy ring setup. That is because such rings generally have three adjustment screws, as you can see in this dual ring assembly in the photo. But notice that I have the laser pointer mounted in the rings and atop of another special little device. This is a mini Alt-As mount that enables fine precision XY directional movements. This configuration is a little bit awkward or cumbersome looking, but it is the most effective and inexpensive little device I have found so far for fulfilling this requirement. So, armed with all these accessories and after a little daytime practice, I went out late one night when the weather was looking cooperative. There appeared to be very good seeing conditions on Sunday, August 6th, just before sunup. The columns here marked 1 and 2 on this slide from the medial blue weather forecast have values of 4 and 3 and 4 and 2 at that time. These values are out of a maximum ranking of 5 units. Here in the Tokyo metropolitan area, this is about as best of seeing conditions that we ever get. On that night, even though there was a steady onslaught of low-level clouds, there were often times where minutes of clear views of the moon and planets were available. It simply required a little patience. Unfortunately, it was not possible to see the targets from my usual backyard imaging location due to the surrounding houses. And although I would normally go to a nearby park for deep sky imaging, that was not necessary for planets or the moon. 
The targets are so bright that street lights and home lights don't cause any interference and imaging time only takes a few minutes. So I set up the imaging rig curbside on my driveway where I had a good view of the sky. I first did a North Celestial Polar Alignment, repeating it at least three times to be sure it was accurate. My intention that night was not to use any guiding, so the tracking needed to be accurate to provide at least several minutes on the target at these high focal lengths. On that morning, Saturn was nearly 45 degrees in the sky as it transversed the meridian. But Jupiter was at least 10 degrees lower in the sky, which was less favorable. Also, the brilliantly bright moon resided directly in the middle, but caused no issues. Overall, it was more or less no problem to position the planets in the field of view with the laser and flip mirror eyepiece setup. When the camera video setting was at 1080p resolution, the widest sensor activation setting, the targets were always visible on my smart pad in the ASI Air video menu screen. The hand controller with slow motion control for the ZWO AM5 mount helped to easily position the target toward the center of the field of view in the video setting. And here you are looking at a real-time live video capture of Jupiter at a ROI setting of 480p resolution and Saturn at 360p resolution. ROI stands for Region of Interest and refers to the sensor region that is activated for image capture. These ROI settings of 480 and 360 seem to give the best combination of magnification and clarity in the ASI 533MC Pro camera that I was using that night. Saturn here appears to be jumping around more aggressively than Jupiter, but that simply is because it was being captured at a higher magnification setting. We also did some video imaging the moon as well. Here you can see what that looks like at the widest field of view, a 1080p resolution video setting. That night, in a short period of time, I captured a lot of video image data. In my limited experience, I find that the ASI Studio software is the easiest software to use for video image stacking and processing. I use it for planetary image stacking, but prefer Deep Sky Stacker for nebulae and galaxy image stacking instead. The ASI Studio software has most of the parameter settings all predetermined except for that stacking percentage, which I usually set at the highest stringency, which is 20%. The software generates a stacked image file that can then be adjusted slightly for contrast, brightness, and color, and can be saved as a TIFF or a JPEG file. ASI Studio is very effective and works very well to generate high quality images. For beginners like me, it is a simple and effective option, but probably not the best. Here are a bunch of Jupiter images taken at different ROI and subtly different post-stacking parameter settings, you know, contrast, color, etc. From this set of images, I believe this is probably the best image, seen here with two of its largest moons visible in the photograph. And here are a bunch of Saturn images that I captured using various sensor ROI and post-stacking parameter settings. And from this group, my favorite is this one, captured at 480p with an exposure time of 0.02 seconds per frame. I think it is a beautiful image where you can see some cloud patterns and a dark line in the ring structure, which I suspect is the so-called Cassini division. In case you did not know this information, the axis tilt and orbital plane of Saturn is such that it has a nearly three decade cycle of changing image orientation when viewed from the Earth. And we are rapidly approaching a phase where the rings will be oriented edge on toward the Earth, nearly disappearing from view in 2025. So if you want to photograph the rings, time is running out. 
Here is a 1080p stacked image of the moon that I took that night. The clarity and contrast looks quite beautiful in my opinion. And this also was stacked and processed in ASI Studio. And here is a higher resolution image taken at 640p. The next few images of the moon are all at 1080p. Now let me summarize a bit about the MK105 Maxitov Cassegrain Telescope from Svoboni. I bought it specifically for viewing and imaging double stars, star clusters, and planets. It is my first reflector-based telescope, and the price was surprisingly affordable, so I took the chance and pre-ordered it from Svoboni early last year. I think its quality is very good. It performs higher than its price class. With the imaging train and accessory setup I have demonstrated here in this video, planetary imaging was effective and pretty much issue free. I captured a ton of data on three targets all within about two hours. Now I am not claiming these are the best photos you can achieve with the MK105, but for a mediocre deep sky astrophotographer like myself attempting planetary imaging for only the second time, I think the images are respectable, and I know there are many ways to further improve the quality. For instance, by imaging planets during opposition, they will appear larger cover more camera sensor pixels, and hence offer up more details and resolution. It is also possible to venture away from the city to find better seeing conditions to improve the image capture quality. Most of my imaging data were one to two minutes of video images. By boosting the image capture to more minutes each time, better final images can also be achieved. It may also be possible to reduce exposure time to increase image clarity. Of course, an increased gain setting might be necessary to capture more light, but this is generally a good trade-off. I could also use my other camera, the ASI 678MC Planetary Camera, instead of the 533MC Pro, which I used in this video. The pixel size of the 678MC sensor is slightly smaller and has the potential to increase resolution. However, this benefit may only be achievable under very good seeing conditions, otherwise it makes no difference. I did not use it in this YouTube production because it has a significantly smaller sensor and it's more challenging to find and center objects in the field of view. And finally, there are other more sophisticated image processing software available that offer many more processing options and are perhaps better optimized for planetary image processing. So let me first thank you for joining me here today for another episode of Astrophotography Japan. For me, it is simply fun to tinker with equipment and try out new accessories or telescopes. And I think that I am finally getting more comfortable with planetary imaging. My imaging results appear to be improving, and the activity this time around was certainly less frustrating. Having fun and appreciating our beautiful universe and solar system is what it's all about. I hope you join me again sometime on this channel. I am JP Astro Guy. My name is Paul Cheesegel, and I am an astrophotographer.